I see a bit more of the tattoo has been filled in. Yeah, and it fucking hurts, but let's talk about Doom. <laughs> Doom is a video game franchise that has long established the amount of shits it gives could be countered on one hand by a kid who likes to play with fireworks. True to its roots, the 2016 reboot of the series is unabashedly metal as fuck, with a soundtrack that hits the ears like a dump truck full of Fury Road DVDs. It's also full of demonic imagery. So we're we talking like voice in the background or backmasking or that kind of shit? No, none of that pussy shit they used to do in the 80s. I mean, if you look at Doom's soundtrack on a spectrogram, demonic imagery will flicker up on your screen occasionally, like you're using a haunted version of Windows Media Player. I'm pretty sure there's some people who won't have used Windows Media Player here. And those people are living sad lives. <laughs> because Windows Media Player was the shit. Do you remember? You used to be able to put on, what is it, the visualizer. Oh, whatever God. song you were listening to, it'd interact with it. And I used to like putting on the one that was like all psychedelic and just listening to like my favorite Dragon Force song because it just got ape shit. I'm like, yeah, that's so cool. So 90s. And then Clippy pops up and you go, Clippy, go away. <laughs> Fuck off, Clippy. No. Like, Clippy's dead now, but props to Microsoft for bringing him back in the form of Cortana, which is the helper assistant for, like, Windows 10, and it's the most annoying shit ever. And you have to, like, you have to go into your root directory to disable it, to actually get back the search bar so you can search your own fucking files. So you know what? I disable that shit straight away. But I would still use it if I could go onto my phone and go, Cortana? Go, yes, Master Chief? Yeah. <laughs> You'd make her call you Master I Chief. I would fucking make her call you Master It reminds me a lot. Uh, I worked in a, uh, when I worked in a bar, this guy, um, I used to work as a proper stoner, and he had his Siri call him Split Master. <laughs> <laughs> when he was giving our phone number to our boss so he could contact him for shifts and stuff, he just, <laughs> the phone just came, he went, oh, has he got Siri? Oh, let me try this. He goes, uh, what's my phone number? And then he was going to take it down. He went, hello, Spliff Master, your phone number is this. And the boss handed him the phone back and went, here you go, Spliff Master. <laughs> So who was it that composed the music for the 2016 Doom? That was one Mick Gordon, a legendary large penis hero who composes music for a lot of video games. And he was tasked with basically like, you've know, got to take all the music from the original Doom and make it better. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to pay homage to those original games, but make them heavier and more visceral. And I think he did a fucking fantastic job. Um, the best example you see of that is um, like the iconic theme to the first level of the first Doom. And there's a great interview with Mick Gordon for a documentary about Doom, where he goes, yeah, that Bobby Prince soundtrack is fucking phenomenal. It's one of the most iconic themes in all of gaming. I'm not going to be able to improve upon that, but I can update it. And the way music works in Doom, it's contextual. So the more intense the fight is, the more intense the music becomes. Right, little things like that is why that guy is a pro. And right now, you're going to show people how much of a pro he is by putting that clip of him playing live at the Game Awards. Because that was brilliant. Because he basically says, oh yeah, we've got a, a live performance by Mick Gordon. And it's the heaviest thing you've ever seen. And there's all these tech journalists with beards and glasses and notepads. And then Mick Gordon just headbanging. He's like the Doof Warrior. I love it. He's just so excited to be playing guitar. And like you need someone with that passion making a game like this. That, that's what Doom 26 It was a passion project by people who care about the original. And they wanted to like, you know, pay as much homage to it as possible. So as I said, just taking little things like that from Doom 1993 and finding modern interpretations of it really helped that that sort of get that Doom sound across and really make it feel like it was part of the same franchise. As an aside, because I'm not sure how many people know this, that original Bobby Prince soundtrack um, borrowed a lot of um, riffs from popular heavy metal tracks. And I think F1 M1 is the most blatant because that's very obviously the, you know, the opening to Master of Puppets. And I love how they got away with doing that because obviously it was the 90s and it was a video game and no one gave a shit about video game soundtracks back then. But I think if you released, because you could put in a comparison for like, people at home now so they can see like, you know, how heavily that is inspired by Master of Puppets. Mm -hmm. 
I think if you release Doom today with an updated version of that soundtrack, that isn't like, you know, as heavily um, changed as Mick Gordon did, Metallica will be having words with their lawyer because they're not, they don't have the best reputation for like, you know, um, people using their intellectual property, do they? <laughs> Getting back to the Doom soundtrack once again, Mick Gordon additionally used every piece of technology he could get his hands on to make the soundtrack sound as meaty as possible. What technology did he use? Well, the most simple one is the guitars, and he reportedly used seven, eight, and nine string guitars to make the riffs sound as chugging and heavy as possible. And then he'd filter the music through like, you know, a bunch of musical devices to make it sound more distorted. And I think as well, there was a rumor that he used a chainsaw. <laughs> I, I think he did, yeah. I, I hope I'm remembering that correctly. He did use a chainsaw for one of the songs. There's just a chainsaw in the background. She's like, yeah, fuck it, it's a chainsaw, it's awesome. What's your favorite custom guitar? As in one that's used in a movie or one that's used by a musician? I just mean one that's like not an ordinary six string guitar. I'd say it's got to be uh, the guitar used by Buckethead, which I don't know the exact make, but I know he's got something built into it called a kill switch, yeah. which um, basically does exactly what it sounds like. It just cuts off all sound from the guitar when the button is pressed. And that's how he plays Jordan from um, Guitar Hero 2. Like, you know, the, the weird way it's like the staccato-esque riff that he plays for like, you know, the majority of the song. Yeah. That's how he does that. He has this little kill switch built into his guitar. And I think that's also like, this little stupid device that he uses so well when playing it. I think my favourite one has to be during the song Master Exploder in Pick of Destiny. Mm -hmm. So there's two custom guitars in that. One of them's got three necks. Yes. And KG's got six arms, he's playing that. But the best one, it's a two neck guitar, but it's shaped like a woman's legs. And he plays it like this while he's licking the middle oh, of it. That is so, that is, <laughs> if you just describe that guitar and then ask me what band plays it, I'd have said Tenacious D. <laughs> So you said that Mick Gordon used a lot of technology to make the soundtrack. Yes, and he, were, he had a lot of fun with it, apparently, by putting in a few Easter eggs, which the Doom series is famous for. My favourite one in Doom 2016 being that you get a brief rundown of all the people who've been killed by, like, you know, the demons escaping and killing everybody. And on that list of names, obviously, it's like people who developed the game, people who worked on it, just Sean Bean's in there. Sean Bean died in Doom 2016. He's not even... <laughs> I love that. And I want that to become a meme. I want that to be a thing where in any series where a lot of people die, just Sean Bean's name's just listed somewhere. So he just dies in that universe too. But music-wise, he used the technology to basically just put in a load of like demonic imagery, like I mentioned, like pentagrams and shit, just in the soundtrack. And then what he did is he went into the inaudible frequencies of the songs and just put in a load of demonic shit. The, like, the full extent of which we've apparently not discovered yet because he won't tell anyone what it is. If everybody remembers from Doom 2, there was this really great hidden Easter egg where they had John Romero's head hidden in the final level, right? That sort of head on the pike, I've hidden in one of the tracks here. This is the, the original <laughs> thing. Oh, that's here. cool. And the head on his pike is hidden in one of the tracks. I'm assuming some people actually don't know what spectrograms are. Oh, well, my understanding of them is it just lets you see the waveform of a song. And Gordon saw to it that if you listen to the Doom soundtrack with one of those, you just see a load of demonic stuff pop up, like 666 pentagrams, and he hid those in the inaudible frequencies of the songs, so obviously you can't hear them, but they're there, and I fucking love that idea, because the Doom video game series is infamous, because the first one, like, parents groups decried it, oh yeah, it's full of demon imagery, it's like satanic in nature, it's got all this heavy metal in it, or heavy metal inspired music, or it's really bad for kids, and then you fast forward to 2016, and they are literally beaming demonic imagery and pentagrams directly into your brain as a joke. <laughs> it's like, go Mick Gordon, that's awesome. Oh, how far we've come since the 90s, eh, folks? There's something we've forgotten to mention, Carl. There is, isn't there? There is. And that is Polygon, when they tried to play Doom, and the guy who played Doom sucked at playing Doom. Yeah. Something me and Brad have laughed about multiple times over the past I, couple of years. I think it's come up in several videos. Yeah. I, and I we, put clips in once. Because we, we find it so funny. So if people don't know what we're talking about, um, prior to release of Doom 2016, id Software or Bethesda, I forget which one it is, who was able to hand out review copies, gave out a review copy to Polygon. 
you know, the online video game review site, and the guy they got to play it was so bad that they had to, like, you know, take off comments and the like and dislike bar on the video because everyone was just dunking on him for how shit the guy was. It's like 30 minutes. Oh, yeah, it's 30. And the thing is, though, they put it as, this is Doom. This is what Doom 2016 is. And it's a guy playing who looks as if he's not even comfortable holding a video game controller because he can't walk and aim at the same time. And it just cracks me up that they thought that was acceptable level of quality to showcase for this fucking awesome game and that nobody at it or Bethesda went, hang on, that makes Doom look like a bag of wank. I don't get how someone who is paid to play video games for a living can be so bad at playing video games. Like, I play video games for fun. And I say, I'm not bad, I'm not gonna beast through like Doom on the hardest difficulty, but I bet I could put on more of a showcase and the guy's like, <laughs> The only thing I can assume is that the person who played it was like, the person who was supposed to play it wasn't there. Like they must have got in someone who's never played the game. On, in all the staff and the editors, and someone must have edited the video together, someone must have like, you know, looked at it to make sure it was suitable for publication. None of them went, this looks shit, redo it. I know there's a huge debate out there like, of when it comes to like, reviewing video games. Should the person reviewing video games be able to play them? And the people compare it to film, like, or, or reviewing paintings or books. Like, do you have to be an author to review a book? And I think those comparisons aren't valid because video games are an active medium, whereas films are more passive. Like, you don't need to have made a film to review a film. You just have to have a base level of film literacy. And obviously, I'm not saying if you can't play video games, you can't review them, because obviously that, that viewpoint matters. And there are people out there who that will apply to. It cracks me up that people who do it for a living are still so shit at it. That's what makes me laugh. Like, how at that point, in 2016, if you've been uh, like, uh, sort of immersed in video game culture for that long, have you not played at least one game of Call of Duty? How have you not played at least in like Halo or Novice? Yeah. Or uh, some shit like that, and at least know how to move and aim at the same. And if you don't, why do they not just give it to someone who can? Surely in their offices, there's someone who knows how to play fucking Doom. <laughs> it makes Doom guy look like an idiot. <laughs> I love all stuff like that. And the famous one is the guy who couldn't play Cuphead. Yeah. And like you can put the clip in where he, even though it says on screen, this is what you're supposed to, and you can't figure it out. Is that the jump and dash one? Yeah, we he mentioned that when we mentioned He can't Dubai. figure out how to jump and dash. And I love stuff like that. You just think to yourself, like, you've been doing this for 30 fucking years. You've been, surely you've picked up an Xbox controller at one point in your life, reviewing technology. Sure, and if you don't, why Why would you play it? Why would you upload it? That's what gets me. That's what I was going to say. It's there like, must be someone in the process who's going to look at it and go, he spent five minutes trying to get over a wall. It, it makes the game look bad. Yeah. Like, and I don't understand how a company who's like allowing someone to review it would let that footage out. It's like... We want this to be shown in the best possible light, and you can't get through the fucking tutorial. That's not the image of our product we want out there. I just love the idea that there are people out there who are paid to play video games for a living, and they can't play video games. Can you imagine that in any other industry? Like a, a food critic who's getting well done steak with ketchup on it. Any other industry, you'd be fired immediately. Like, even if it's like a creative or the review industry, you would not succeed, but you can get, like, do really fucking well not being able to understand the base mechanics of a video game, something you've spent your entire adult life apparently playing. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. I love it. Never change.